wanted to um, welcome everybody today for this program. It's a really fun program um, for picking your plants. I'm a Hall County Extension educator, so located in the center part of the state. Um, so a little bit on my background. No, these are not my house plants. However, these are my mother's house plants. So from a very early age, I got the honor and privilege of uh, watering all these houseplants on a regular basis. So we lived and grew up in the country in the middle of central Nebraska. So a lot of the houseplants that we have did not require um, very much finesse. Um, they were very tough. They grew well. And these are both uh, south and east facing windows. So I mean, a lot of houseplants that were covered. So I caught the bug at an early age. I have a few houseplants on my own, um, but when we start talking about houseplants, the first thing we need to talk about is that houseplant care. So we want to avoid going to the garden center and going to the nursery and picking out the prettiest plant that we could pick. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the right environment for that plant to thrive. And so when it comes down to that, we need to make sure that we have that, that right environment. So for starters, that right environment includes the light. So there's different light categories that houseplants will fall into. We have those houseplants that will take that low indirect light. Um, they don't require much light at all. They're easy to grow if you don't have a full sun location, whether that's a south facing window or a west facing window, these low light plants are going to do well in that north or east, east facing window. Now we have those plants that are under that average light category. So these plants are going to need about four hours of bright indirect sun. Now indirect sun means that the sun is not directly shining onto the leaf surface. It means that the room is bright, uh, but the sun is not directly shining on those plants. And so these average light plants need to have some sunlight within four to eight feet of a window. Now, when we talk about those bright light plants, those are gonna be the plants that need more than four hours of that bright indirect light in close proximity to that window. They need to be very close to a window to make sure that they receive enough light. And then we have that other category of plants that really likes those hot, dry conditions. They can handle that direct sunlight on the leaf surface and they're going to do extremely well in those types of locations. We need to take into consideration the moisture and the humidity. So like Scott talked about, we're going to cover next week watering and fertilizing, um, but some house plants can be grown in water. They, they don't need a potting mix or a potting media in order to do well. Um, some house plants are going to like that moist condition, but not overly wet. So they like to be watered on a regular basis. That potting media is kept moist, but it's not extremely wet. Most house plants are going to fall into that dry in between waterings category. What that means is you're going to water it um, once a week, maybe every other week, depending on the plant, and you're just going to let it dry out completely. There's lots of um, products on the market that'll assist you with this. I believe John has some singing bird ones that will assist you. The birds will start singing if um, the water, if your plant needs water. There's other ones I've seen that are like a worm or other ones you could do a soil moisture probe um, that tell you when the plants are going to need water. And my favorite category are those very forgiving plants. Those ones that you kind of forgot to water and then you go to water again and they do just fine. When we talk about humidity with house plants, we have that average home humidity, um, whether that's the 40% humidity or once we get to 50% humidity, we have that group of house plants that really likes that high humidity. Those are gonna be those types of plants that we put in the bathroom because they're going to love that very humid environment. 
On the other hand, we have other plants that don't like it very humid. When we talk about those succulents and those cacti and things like that, um, they really don't like that humid of an environment. And again, we have the very forgiving category. Those that really don't care what the humidity is as long as they have their needs met in other ways. Now, when it comes to temperatures, that they also fall into some other categories. So most foliage houseplants will tolerate those tempers, temperatures between 65 and 75 degrees. Um, with these plants, they'll do well in an average home. We don't have to have it super warm. Uh, we don't have to have it really humid. Average house uh, temperatures are going to be great. Now, the thing to keep in mind, and especially um, because we were so cold earlier on, is in the winter, sometimes we have those plants that are placed on the window ledge. And what we need to do is place your hand between the plant and the window. And if you, it feels cool to you, it's going to feel cold for that plant. And you're going to need to move that plant away from the window for the time being. Uh, earlier this week, uh, we had temperatures 25 below with a wind chill of 38 below. At that point in time, your plants need to be moved away from the window or they're going to start showing signs of cold injury. And cold injury can look kind of like uh, frozen lettuce where it looks water soaked and it just doesn't look quite right. Um, so we need to make sure that we take those temperatures into consideration in the winter, as well as in the summer, because in the summer we can have those windows do the opposite, where that light is going to come through, that window is going to be very hot, that plant material is going to cook if it touches that window. So we need to make sure that we keep in mind the proximity of those plants um, when they're by that growing environment, when they're by that window. Now, earlier, Scott talked about the continuum uh, for houseplant growers, whether they are a serious plant grower, maybe they love a specific variety or a specific species of plant, they go like gangbusters, they go to shows, they, they are very serious growers. And then on the other hand, we have the hands-off growers. So those hands-off growers are the ones that we like the house plant, we keep it in the house, and we water it. And that is the category that a lot of these plants that I'm talking about fall into. They are going to be mainly the hands-off type of a plant, not a lot of um, difficulty, not a lot of care. Um, the reason that I like the hands-off plants is because I not only have two small children, I also have two dogs. So some of the plants that I'm talking about today can not only survive two small children, but can also survive having two dogs in the house that have tails that are seriously like a baseball bat and knock that plant material around. So the first plant is going to be the low light category. With the low light category, we, we talk about that Chinese evergreen, that aglinomia. Um, this is going to be one that's readily available. There's lots of different cultivars on the market, whether it's one that's got a hint of pink in it, one that's got a hint of um, silver coloration in it, there's speckled. So there's lots of different colorations within the aglinomia. But these guys are ones, they're going to grow fairly slowly and you need to repot when they reach the edges of the pot. Now, if they don't receive enough light, what we'll see is we'll see them start to stretch. And what you will see, um, and I attempted to rescue an aglinomia that did not have enough light. It did not go well, um, but you will have a bunch of cane or stem tissue. And then at the top, you've got that flush of foliage. Um, there are some ways you can try to revamp that, but unfortunately it takes a lot of work to get that plant back to the to the area where you want to use it and where it's going to thrive and look nice. So by making sure it's in the right environment right off the bat, that can help so that way you're not having to try to go in and rescue it. Now this plant has this name for a reason. 
cast iron plant. This thing is tough as nails. It can stand heat, it can stand cold. It falls into that very forgiving category where you just have to dust it. And Scott talked about putting those plants into the shower. This is one, if you need to wash the dust off, you can do that. But it has long strap-like leaves and it spreads by rhizomes or below ground stems. There's lots of different leaf variations on this, um, whether you get the, the straight green leaf, there's speckled, there's variegated, but this is one that is very forgiving, likes low light, um, does very well. And everybody's favorite house plant, the pothos. And I say that because when we think about an easy to grow vining house plant that doesn't require a lot of care, doesn't require a lot of light, automatically it's the pothos that comes to mind. Um, these guys can tolerate lower humidity. I have them just growing in my kitchen. My kitchen has one west facing window and it does extremely well. Um, there's more and more different cultivars that are on the market. Um, they've got the, the yellow speckled. You have the, the marble queen, which is the white speckled. Um, there's also some lime uh, green kind of colored ones. And then one of the ones that I just had to try was that cultivar down on the bottom called the Enjoy. Um, I just think it's really fun to have that leaf that's just a little bit different. Um, these guys are one that if they don't receive enough light again, we're gonna see that inner node get really long between the leaves on there. Um, but it is one that you can give it a haircut, you can pot it up, um, you can continue to grow it in that location, um, but it is a super easy house plant to, to start with. And then it's a uh, very closely related cousin, the philodendron. This is another one. When we talk about those vining house plants, um, almost everybody's grandmother or mother at some point in time had a philodendron, and it was always the climbing philodendron. Um, but this genus is very broad. It not only contains those climbing ones that we're really familiar with, but it also contains those that are going to be bigger. Um, so there's going to be some tree philodendrons that are out there. And so those are going to be bigger. We also have those more potted types that we will see that's going to have more upright form to it. So just because we see philodendron, a lot of people automatically go to the Hartley philodendron vine, um, but it is a species that contains a lot of them. Uh, easy to grow can tolerate lower lights. And again, if we have too low of light with those vining ones, we'll see that inner node length between leaves get really long. Um, and I tried this, um, the genus of the Brazil, and it, it's a fun one. It's got that limey green coloration to it that are some that are completely green as well or completely lime green as well. There's also a silver philodendron. Um, I think it's called the, the devil ivy as another name for it, um, but that one is another fun philodendron as well that has those silvery speckly leaves on it as well. Now we don't usually have many new plants into our industry, but the ZZ plant or the eternity plant is quote unquote new. Um, it's new because it started in the house plant trade in 1990. Now, this is a plant that some people say it doesn't grow, it doesn't die, it just sits there. This one grows extremely slow, and that's good, um, but the cool part about this one is it can handle those low lights, super glossy leaves on it. Um, it's hard, it looks like somebody used leaf shine, um, but there is no leaf shine on that leaf surface. It's just that glossy anyway. Now these guys are ones that are toxic. So we need to keep that in mind if you have pets that are running around that might gnaw on them or chew on them. Um, the ones that were toxic, we, we tried to pull out. So that way we would know, you know, if we had to be cautious with it. But this is one that is toxic. 
Now we need to make sure we allow that root ball to dry out in between waterings. Um, we had the question earlier that it was kind of dying back from the top and you know, mine does that as well. Um, just be patient with it, it's a super gro slow grower. Average light requirement, again, these are the ones that can have four hours of sunlight and located within that four to eight feet of a window. And I know we talked about prayer plant as being a tough one to kind of grow. I will just let you know that if I can grow a prayer plant, it's got to be one anybody else can grow as well. Um, I've got the long strap like leaf calthea on there. Um, it's a really fun one. I did happen to kill the prayer plant. Um, that's the more common one. It, it just didn't thrive very well. But this is one that does like those humid environments. And the reason it gets its name prayer plant is because these large leaves fold up at night. And then during the day, they unfold again. Um, that root system prefers to be wet or moist, but not overly wet. So this is one that's going to be one of those touchy ones. You know, it's going to be the next step up from a super simple pothos or philodendron. Um, but this is one that has a lot of different um, species in it, lots of different leaf types in it, lots of different ones to try. The next one is going to be the Diefenbacher, the dumb cane. Uh, this is one that does fairly well. It's pretty easy. It's hands off, large, huge leaves on it that are attached to a large cane. Um, and again, if this one does not receive enough light, just like that aglanomia does, we'll see that stem really elongate and start to stretch. Um, I tried to revive one that was in my office when I started in extension and because the cane was just so long and the leaves were only at the tip. Let's just say it did not go as I had planned. Um, occasionally, sometimes that happens, but this guy, if it had received enough light, it would remain compact, it would remain full. If we don't get enough of that bright filtered light, that's when we start to see them start to stretch. But it's one of those that likes the average air temperatures, average water requirements, but it is toxic um, because it contains compounds um, that if you eat, um, it will cause some crystallization, some oxalic acid, some other um, acids in your mouth that can cause damage. Now, um, the research I've shown, so has anyone died from eating it? No, but we really don't want to take that risk if you have people, little children or pets around, um, just make sure that know that some of these, these plants are toxic. This is another one of the easiest to grow, extremely forgiving plants. Um, some people call it the spider plant. Some people call it the airplane plant. But what it is, is it produces a mother plant. And then when the plant is happy, it sends out these stolons and then it produces a baby plant at the bottom. So what you can do is you can cut those baby plants off, you can root them, and you can start your, your plant again. Now there are both variegated cultivars out there, like the one that we've shown, and there's green. Now the more light that you have, the more variegation you're going to have. If you have a more shaded environment or not as bright of a light, you're going to notice that variegated one the green areas are going to get wider and that's just because that plant is trying to get more and more um, light and be able to utilize that light to the most environment and make enough food. So, you know, just keep in mind some of these plants might not have as bright of a color if it's a purple foliage or as much variegation if it's not receiving a lot of light. This guy needs to be repotted when it's root bound. And I've been told that this one likes to flower when it's root bound. So when you see those flowers come out, then you know that your spider plant is root bound. And when they get root bound, they get root bound. Um, you're probably gonna have to take a knife. You're probably gonna have to rip and tear when it comes to repotting this one. But this is one that'll need to be repotted when it's root bound and bump it up to the next pot. Uh, we will cover repotting um, at the end of our series in March. And so if you have specific questions about repotting at that point in time, we'll cover those. 
Peperomia, no, not pepperoni. Peperomia is a very common houseplant that we have. It's easy to grow and it's uh, low and slow and it makes kind of a mound. There are some other ones that will grow uh, more of a trailing type. This guy does prefer that bright indirect light, but it can live in fluorescent lights very well. Um, so that's a fun one that you can, you can use. Now it does have a rat tail flower, so don't be concerned um, with that. So it, it literally looks like a rat tail. I mean, you grow some of these foliage house plants for the foliage. You don't grow them for the flower. So a lot of times their flowers really aren't that appealing or that aesthetic but it is one that is easy to propagate or take a leaf. And um, if you are able to grow another plant from it. So when we talk about our Boston fern, now this is going to be one that either you love it or you hate it. Um, the reason for that, this soil likes to remain moist. It likes to have that high humidity. Now, oftentimes we can grow these outdoors and then we'll bring them in for the winter and then they shed leaves all winter long. And that's not uncommon for these plants. They like that full sun. They like that bright indirect light. We bring them indoors for winter and we don't have the same light intensity. And that's when we start to, to see them start to struggle. Uh, we wanna make sure we repot these um, when they are root bound, and again, pulling them out of the pot, seeing if you see the root ma material there, that's gonna let you know um, if they're starting to get root bound. Weeping fig, this is another one, it likes those bright locations. It is one that we can take outdoors in the summertime. We just need to make sure that when we bring it back in, we don't freak out because what will happen with this plant is it has a set of leaves for when it's outdoors. We bring it inside in the fall and then all of a sudden it starts dropping all of its leaves. What it's doing is it's acclimatizing to its new environment. And so it's putting on another set of leaves for that new environment. Now, this guy is one of the ones that is a heavy feeder. Um, you could feed it throughout the growing season um, on a regular basis and it will do extremely well, but this one likes those bright locations. English ivy is another one that likes those bright locations. And especially if you have that variegated one, we need to make sure we maintain that bright environment so we can keep that coloration. This likes that moist soil. We wanna make sure that we keep that soil moist and that we have high humidity. So ferns, ivies, those types of plants do really, really well in bathrooms or in terrariums because they have that higher humidity. Um, and they do really well in those types of locations. Um, this one is one that there's lots of different um, cultivars that are on the market with different variegations. You could get straight green. Um, in warmer climates, people grow them outdoors, but unfortunately in Nebraska, some of us uh, have to re re use them as a house plant. And then our peace lilies. Now, this is one of my favorite house plants that you're going to do if you're just starting out with house plants. And the reason for that is this thing is so forgiving. It can do low light, it can do high light. My favorite part is it wilts when it's thirsty. So if you watch a peace lily and as it starts to get thirsty and need water, the leaves just kind of slowly begin to wilt or or droop. Then when you go ahead and water it, the leaves perk back up. Um, this one produces flowers kind of when it's root bound. So that's going to be your indication to be on the lookout when you see this plant begin to flower. Hey, it could be root bound. Now the thing to keep in mind with this one is it is toxic to cats. So the main thing with this is we need to make sure we keep those cats from chewing on it or we keep them in a location where the cat can't get to them. And then the arrowhead plant is another one that is a super easy plant to grow. Um, it's kind of got a creeping habit to it. 
and it can do the low light and it is easy to care for. Um, indirect light for those variegated varieties, um, or they'll start to revert or they'll go back to the straight species, that green species. Now this one is toxic to people and to pets. So we need to be on the lookout for that one. But this one is one that's also very forgiving, fairly easy to use um, and to grow. And then let's go into the bright light because some of you have nice south facing windows out there. So when we get down to it, we have the croton. Everybody loves the croton because we not only have that bright colored foliage, but we also have um, the interesting texture. So there's different forms of the croton leaf. Some of them are long and strap light. Some of them are ovate. Some of them look like dinosaur tracks. Um, so we have all sorts of different shapes. Now this one would be like houseplants 2.0. We would uh, take a little bit of extra care because it can be difficult to grow, but in the right conditions, right environment, and with the right care, it is one that can thrive. Uh, likes its evenly moist soils. This one does produce a latex like sap. Um, so some people that are allergic to latex might have a reaction to that sap if it breaks open on your skin. Jade plants are ones that have been very um, popular because it is one of those succulent plants. It grows best in that high light environment. Because it's a succulent, what you want to do is water it and allow it to dry out. Now jade are very slow growing and we need to make sure we use the proper potting mix when it comes to the jade and that we give it the proper drainage that it needs. Um, but when it comes to the jade plant, we have the fun flat leaves to them or we've got the long tube-like leaves. Some people call them Shrek ears, um, but we've got those two different leaf shapes to them. Christmas cactus, Easter cactus, Thanksgiving cactus, all of those are probably going to be in, in the same category. These guys like that bright and direct light. Um, water when the soil is dry. When these guys bloom based upon day length. And so if we want our Christmas cactus to bloom at Christmas, we need to make sure that we are following the light requirements that that plant needs. Also during that time frame, we need to make sure that the room is a little bit cooler and that will help to promote the buds. The last thing we want to do on any of these holiday cacti is move them when the buds are formed. And the reason for that is because if we go to move it when those buds are closed, um, it's going to shed a bunch of those blooms and that's the whole reason that we want to grow it. I had to throw African violets in because I knew Scott was the other co-presenter today and he loves his African violets. And this is one that's really cool. I love African violets. Um, you know, I'm one of those that I water from the bottom just because as I have been scolded by my grandmother not to get the foliage wet. Um, but as we learned from Scott earlier today, water the plants however it works. But this one um, does fairly well in the right conditions. I haven't found those right conditions yet. I need to take a, a African violet course from Scott. And mother-in-law's tongue, Sansevieria. There's lots of different uh, cultivars on the market for this one as well. Some of them are straight green. Some of them are going to have variegation. There's even one that's completely round and looks more like a like a cattail um, instead of a flat blade. But there's tall varieties, short varieties. They like that bright sun for several hours in a day, and they are very easy um, to, to grow. I'll touch really quickly on succulents and cacti. So. When we talk about them, we have the aloe vera. This one likes that direct sun, or if it does not receive enough sun, it will be extremely slow growing. And with any of these succulents or cacti, we need to make sure that we water when the soil has been completely dried out. Um, in some of our, our succulents, we can cut back watering in the winter as well because they're not in that heated environment. They're not losing as much water throughout the day, um, but that is one that we can do. Cacti, they like that direct sunlight. They're going to need as much sunlight during the day as they possibly can. Uh, allow the soil to dry out fully between 
between waterings. I had a college professor that told us we needed to water our cactus when it rained in Arizona. Um, so he watered it very infrequently. So it has, most cacti have a very shallow root system, which means we have to have a shallow container with that as well. And we have to use that proper cacti potting mix with that. This is one that I got a few years ago um, just to try because I figured why not. Um, this is the fire stick red pencil tree. Um, it needs that bright light indoors. Um, water sparingly as you go. It needs super good drainage. It's toxic if ingested and the sap can be an irritant because it's a euphorbia, it has that milky sap. Sometimes it comes in contact with your skin and you can have a reaction of, um, from that. But it is a really fun one, a little bit different form than most cacti and succulents that we have. Oh, sorry. So we have lots of neb guides out there on growing great houseplants. Um, one about growing them and one insect control. We also have uh, foliage house plants as well, and we have other house plant resources that are out there. And so with that, I will stop my share. And if we have a bunch of questions, we can go ahead and, and start answering some of those questions as we go. We have a few that have come in and I know they're being typed, but we had one uh, to talk a little bit more about summer care and which can go in side or which stay inside and which go outside. And I know that really depends on like how you want to care for it. Like outside, they're going to dry out very fast. So you're going to have to water a lot more. Um, and those things that, that don't like to dry out like the calthea because they typically, you know, they require very high humidity. Humidity might be good outside, but they're going to dry out very fast. So what are your thoughts? And Scott, John Fesh, anyone else can jump in. So it all depends on what your growing environment is like outside. Um, when I lived in the house that had a patio on the north side, I loved it because I could put my ferns outdoors. Um, they would have that bright, intense light that they really preferred, put a dish underneath them to increase that humidity, and it allowed that soil ball, that ball to remain that much wet, more moist or wet. Um, also, some of my other ones really enjoyed it outside. I had a china doll that would go outside and it really enjoyed it. It had that intense light that it really liked. But like John said, some of those that like that higher humidity, moisture conditions, if you're not out there providing enough water and enough moisture to them, especially in those locations where we can get in the 90s or the hundreds during our summer months, um, we can see those plants just not do really well. It also makes a difference too, like I had a jade plant that was growing indoors. Jade plant likes that really bright light. I put it outdoors. I didn't put it in the shade first. It got sunburnt. And there's nothing more painful for a plant parent than a sunburnt plant because you can't do anything about that. So we need to make sure that if we take those house plants outside, we take those steps so that they are ready for that environment that's out there because that light intensity is way different outdoors than it is inside. And yeah. just, just to follow up on what Elizabeth was saying, you know, those, if you've been to Florida or Southern California, many of these plants we're talking about are outdoor landscape plants. And so that should help to kind of set the, the tone. And then to follow up on what she was talking about, uh, Scott has taught me over the years to really do a transition uh, the house plants you've moved outdoors, you got to move them back, but not all at once. <laughs> Almost like to have two or three areas where you can transition them uh, to work with the light and the humidity as it changes from the indoors to the outdoors. Um, but I think keeping the natural environment or at least a, uh, a place where it doesn't freeze year round, um, because none of these plants have much frost tolerance or low temperature tolerance. So keeping that in mind really does help a lot. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to say, you know, it's that transition, like going out and getting the sunburn or drying out or coming back in, you'll, you know, so some plants like there, I have plants that I don't move out because they're the ones that I think don't do, you know, they won't do as well. And the transitions, like 
I have a giant Monstera plant that takes up like half the dining room. Number one, I don't want to have to move it. Like it's really hard to move. But number two, like if I lose a few leaves, I lose a great part of the plant because, you know, the plant takes up half of my living dining room, but it only has like six leaves on it. Um, because, you know, each leaf is like this big. Um, so we had a question about someone wanted to know their Sansevieria bloom this year for the first time ever. Does it need to be transplanted? Um, and John answered probably yes. And that's because those plant, some of those plants that we don't think about blooming, they don't bloom unless they're pot bound um, because it's sort of like a survival mechanism. Like in nature, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm out of space for my roots here. I can't get any bigger. So I better have some children that can go somewhere else. Uh, and reproduce in somewhere else. Um, so I think we have a few more questions popping in. So prayer plant, Calthea, how do we know if the humidity is 50% and how do we increase it in winter? So when they sell these handy little things that test humidity inside houses, um, I don't know the proper term, it's very long and probably sounds very scientific, but you can get those and you can put those in the area where your house plants are. If you're looking at increasing humidity around your house plants in the winter time, you can set up a humidifier. Um, you could also do the handy tray um, with rocks and then set the plants on top of that. And then you pour water in the rocks below and that increases that humidity. If you put your plants together, in a location too, if they're all losing moisture through their leaves, they're increasing that humidity in that location as well. So those are all some ways that you can bump up that humidity um, in that location. Now, when I worked at my office, I would always have a humidifier and I would blame it on my nosebleeds why I had to have the humidifier. But in all reality, I did it so my house plants were all happy at the office. Yeah, a humidifier, um, you know, we, we run one here at home most of the time uh, and that really helps. So uh, this person bought a hibiscus tree and brought it inside after frost. So it lost all of its leaves. How do I know if it's still alive? So some of those tropicals, when we bring them inside, like we talked about that light intensity not being the same, um, if the ends of the branches are still pliable, if they um, snap off readily, most of the time that plant is not looking very promising as still being alive. But the ends of the branches, if they're still pliable, um, be on the lookout for those. Also be on the lookout for mealybugs. Scott talked about those, but those are gonna be the fuzzy looking cotton ball dots on them. Um, hibiscus are really prone to those as well. And so sometimes if we get a heavy infestation, we can, we can do that. We'll talk about insects later, um, but I do know hibiscus are one of those that just are magnets for mealybugs. So my peak pink phytonia trails over the pot. I've noticed that, it, that as it trails, the leaves closest to the soil drop off. The leaves on the end of the stem are more pink than the closer ones. Is it the amount of light? Or could it be if the bottom le the bottom leaves are dropping off? Could it be nutrient deficiency? Maybe I'd have to see a, see a picture of it. Um, but if some of those leaves are more shaded than others, we might not see as intense of a color, um, especially on some of those color color the ones with coloration and <laughs> on them. And I can't talk today, but yes, we can see that more intense if they've got more sunlight. That even goes for, you know, if your plant's near a window, the side near the window will oftentimes have more coloration. So we need to rotate that and then we'll see that coloration more equal uh, across the entire plant. Uh, can we talk about asparagus fern? Okay. <laughs> we could. Um, again, it's gonna be one of those that likes a lot of light. Um, so asparagus fern is one of those, uh, the spring rye fern, the foxtail fern, all those guys are going to um, require that little bit of extra light. They like that bright light intensity. 
those are ones that if you want to take them outside, you can take them outside. Just make sure that you get the water on them because um, those guys go through a lot of water. And you got to make sure you're careful because people don't think about it, but ferns have little barbs on them and they will actually catch you um, if you're not paying attention. So be careful around your ferns, um, especially your spring rye fern and sometimes your foxtail fern too. My aloe plant is having all kinds of babies. Should I remove and repot each one and make them a new plant? Um, and what size of a pot should I put it in since they grow so fast? I would go ahead and pull the babies out and leave the mother plant in there. Um, you know, the size of the pot really determines on how big those babies are. You know, if we have those little tiny ones that would fit in a two to three inch pot, um, go ahead and do that. Uh, otherwise, if you've got some babies that got a little bigger, you're going to bump them up to the next size pot. Most of those houseplants, we don't want to put them in a pot that's too big. Um, even though it sounds like a great deal to put them in a pot that's bigger now, so we don't have to deal with them later, um, your best bet's to start them in a smaller pot and bump them up with time so that way that plant gets its roots established. Also, because it's in a smaller pot, it's going to use more of that moisture and that soil or that potting mix isn't going to stay as wet. And then I don't think we have as many issues with like fungus gnats, um, because if we used a too big of a pot, that pot, that soft potting mix stays really wet. And then we have fungus gnat issues, which are not fun to deal with either. So this person has windows that have built in UV protectors on them. So they need to supplement light. What's a good source of light? Maybe this is a good question for Scott. He's the light expert. Uh, I, I, thanks, John. Um, um, and Elizabeth. Um, that, it is a really good question. There's a lot of exciting research that is currently being done on the effects of UV light, ultraviolet light, the, all those. And um, what we're trying to do is replicate the sun is ultimately our end goal. Uh, <clears throat> grow lights will help, uh, but if your plants appear to be happy and healthy, if you they don't look like they're struggling, then leave it. Uh, but if you would like to supplement, uh, uh, go to your favorite garden center, see what type of grow lights they may have. Uh, but if it's not broke, don't fix it. But if, they're, if they look like they're struggling, you might need to get one or two grow lights, either incandescent, fluorescent, or LED, whatever kind of fits your budget and kind of fits the space in which you're, but those plants are growing. When I bring in my hibiscus, I trim it back. Should I do this or let it go until spring when it goes back outside? One thing I'll say, I mean, I don't know that you have to do it, but the if it's a big plant, the smaller you make it, the less stuff you're going to have to do to it. Like the less water it's going to need, the easier it is going to be able to, to take care of it if it's smaller. But yeah, with the hibiscus, they love that full sun, all day sun, so they can really go big during the summer. So trimming it back just makes it easier on us bringing it in, taking it out. Uh, but just keep in mind the hibiscus will drop its leaves, they turn bright yellow, and they pout. I think they pout worse than a ficus. So just keep that in mind too. So my snake plant, mother-in-law plant, has it in, I have it in low light, but your slide says different. Does this cause slow growth or other issues? So snake plant or mother-in-law's tongue, it can go in a wide range of conditions. It can go low light, it can go bright light. The thing to keep in mind, especially if it goes in the lower light and we've got that taller cultivar that's out there, um, we can see that kind of open up and flop open if it doesn't receive enough light. Um, the shorter ones I don't think are quite as um, prone to it. Um, I know my mom had one back of the house and it was very far away from the window. And we had a big issue with that one really opening up when it didn't get enough light. So what is a good environment for a Hoya plant? <laughs> Those things are tough. 
like I had a Hoya vine and I had a window at work that's the northeast window, the possible worst window for a horticulturalist to have that loves houseplants. And that thing just went off and started vining. And now it is in my kitchen up on top of my cabinet near a west window that mainly gets, you know, it gets some sun, but it, there's a tree that blocks it. So, I mean, those things do extremely well and they are tough plants. Um, I don't think mine will ever bloom, but that's okay. I still like it. One thing to remember with Hoya, um, because I bought, I bought one of the fancy ones, the, the, the Hindu rope, that's the all spirally. So I can, well, if you see mess, don't, don't look, but you can see like right here. You know, there's my Hindu rope Hoya right there. Um, the one thing that I've learned is that they're actually epiphytes. So you don't want them in a heavy soil. You want it in like a, a chunkier mix so that there's lots of air space in the soil. That's the one thing that I've learned. Um, so we have lots of questions coming in, some over in the chat. Over in the chat, I have an eight foot fiddly fig that's in a south window putting on lots of leaves. Um, should I prune some of them out? It's getting pretty top heavy. I would say pruning is gonna help it bush out more so that you get a better structure if you have these, like it depends on the form you want. Like I've seen some that are just like a tall, like big long, if you don't want that, you prune it back and that bushes out the growth and that'll be more sturdy so you don't have to support it. And it depends on how many trunks for lack of a better term that thing has. If it's got one and you do that, that's fine. But if we have multiple ones, like I'm always one, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. And so I would do a trial run with one of the trunks and cut it back and see how it flushes out. And if that's the form that you like, um, rather than mowing them all down right at one time too. Um, I bought two crotons at the same time. I did the same thing with both, but one is delighted and the other one died right after I tried to feed it. A uh, leaf fell off, the stem discolored, and then all the other leaves fell off. Any other chance it could make a comeback for life in the next in next summer? It doesn't sound like it. <laughs> yeah, my suspicion on a plant like that is that there's something wrong in the roots. Uh, damaged roots, tangled roots, rotting roots, some kind of root problem. And you know, it's frustrating because at this time of the year is not a great time of the year to open up, dump it out on your kitchen table and look at the roots. It, you know, it, you can do that. It's just putting it all back together again just makes it more difficult. And my favorite place to do that is a picnic table or a patio table in May. Um, and a lot of times that is a good um, May activity to sort of solve problems that built up over the winter. But yeah, there's probably something there that is unseen. Yeah, and it could have been like um, that one got too much water at the nursery or at the plant shop, you know, and you had root rot or, you know, so there's there's lots of things, you know, if you treated them exactly the same, it could have been something from before you and likely a root problem. One thing that we also don't take in consideration, we can plant our house plants too deep. So when that plant was in production, it could have been upshifted and maybe potted too deep. That could also play, play a part. Yeah. So one more question I have in the chat. Do you recommend systemic insecticide and is it bad for any plants? So it really depends on what pests you're targeting. Um, there are systemic insecticides that are targeted for house plants. And if so, if you're going to be doing that, make sure you know what pest you're targeting and make sure you know what plant you're applying it to. Um, because there are some house plant pests, let's just be honest, they are difficult to get rid of. Um, you know, when we talk about our mealy bugs, that one's not a fun one to try to get rid of. I, I don't know how I got scale on an, on one of my house plants, but I got scale on one of my house plants and that's extremely difficult to get rid of. So, I mean, if you have certain pests that are really difficult to get rid of, you can use a systemic insecticide. You just have to make sure you use one labeled for use with house plants and for the pest you're targeting. 
And I know there's actually a very common one that a lot of houseplant people use that is a systemic houseplant. Uh, it's bonide. Um, right. That's, I mean, it's a merit, it's a meteor culprit. Yes. And uh, we also need to remember that uh, most houseplant systemics will not take care of spider mites. A, just uh, again, like Elizabeth said, read and follow the label. It will tell you what insects it can and cannot manage. And that's what we're here for too. If you need insect identification, please reach out to any of us. Uh, we'd be more than happy to help identify it. So that way you can get with the right product to manage it. Yeah. I agree. Like we think, we think, especially if it's a systemic or a general insecticide that it's going to kill everything. But like Scott said, it might not kill spider mites. You might have to do, you know, an insecticidal soap or a neem oil or something like that. You know, so it's, it's knowing what you're doing and, you know, the systemic, a lot of people use that as a preventative. I mean, I guess you could do that. And that might especially be useful if you're like taking your plants out in the summer and bringing them back in because we always get some sort of insect in there but you know just to use an insecticide just because isn't necessarily the best practice um someone said i was gifted a plant that i don't know what it is so i don't know how to care for it it's surviving but not thriving can i email a picture for id and that absolutely you can email it you can find um, our offices have facebook pages so you can look for you know, Nebraska Extension in Douglas and Sarpy counties or Nebraska Extension in Hall County. Uh, and we, you know, you can send it there. Um, but, you know, Scott is sharing our email addresses. Is it good to name every plant that you bring in? It, not, neem oil is a, um, it's a more gent gentler insecticide, but if you don't have an insect problem, then we're just wasting product. And again, it's, it's a feel good. We're making ourselves feel better by doing something, but you can just wash your plants off with water. Yeah. I, it's a, Everybody has it. We don't have to do any special mixing. So water is a great way to knock insects off before we bring them indoors. And like Scott said, um, neem is a pretty ge gentle insecticide and doesn't generally kill uh, beneficial insects. However, uh, just on general principle, like he said, we don't want people to apply insecticides when there isn't an insect to kill because it leads to insecticide resistance which nobody wants. And the same thing with herbicides or fungicide. Um, too much reliance on any particular pest control agent is bad. And um, Scott, John, and Elizabeth have spent the last two hours explaining all the very good um, cultural practices, the proper selection, the humidity, the light, all those kinds of things that work far better than any of these insecticides or, or fungicides that people have asked about. So focus on the best management practices for best results. And so we'll, I think we'll leave it there. So Elizabeth put in the chat, uh, digital diagnostics, you can also go there. Anytime you have any plant, garden, insect question, you can go there, you can share um, your um, pictures, you can ask questions. And the nice thing is that that sort of shifts it out across the state. If like there's one of us that knows that thing better than other people, it will send it to us. Uh, we'll get notified that it's, you know, like I do mainly uh, fruits and vegetables. I get all the fruit and vegetable questions. Other people see those too. And, you know, it depends on which of us see that first to answer it. Mm -hmm.